Hey, it's Carrie with another episode of Garnside Chats here on a chilly Friday afternoon. Thanks for joining me. Um, today, our workshop is not so much hands on, it's a little more conceptual. Um, and it's about how to winterize your garden for while preserving um, habitat and, um, you know, livelihood spaces for insects and why that consideration is important. So we'll discuss that and also just uh, talk about some like timely tips because the low is going to be pretty low tonight and will result in probably another frost. Um, so let's get going. Okay, so winterizing your garden uh, essentially just means uh, you're getting your garden ready for the kind of main off season of gardening, which is the winter time. Uh, most gardeners just uh, garden in the summertime, so they've got a lot of tender, what we call tender plants. Uh, tender refers to uh, these plants not being able to uh, withstand freezing temperatures. Uh, I've got my garden assistant with me. Hi. Um, so what happens with those plants are, oh my gosh, Garfield, get a hold of yourself. Our, uh, so all plants have cell walls. Um, animals do not have cell walls. Their cells are a little more able to kind of like contract and change shape and, you know, do all this kind of stuff. But plants have cell walls that kind of look like this. Um, and if, we, if you have a tender plant, like a tomato, say, that my tomatoes died last week, a uh, tomato, such as over here, uh, what happens is freezing temperatures will expand the fluids inside the cell, which will expand, freezing expands the fluids, and then those cell walls burst, uh, resulting in the death of the plant. So as you can see, my garden is a little cooler than some places at in Colombia. Um, so I had a hard frost last week. So these are my tomatoes. They're tender. So all of these cell walls burst and the plant died. So when I came out, that happened last Thursday. When I came out last third, or I'm sorry, last Friday morning, um, the plants still looked pretty good. Like early in the morning, you know, they, they had frost. They were kind of like glistening and it was beautiful. They were still green and vibrant and kind of like upright mostly. Um, but as the day wore on and that frost kind of like burned off, uh, they started to turn darker and they eventually kind of turned this like black, kind of like limp, rubbery, uh, eventually they'll get kind of slimy consistency and that is just, it's dead. Like it's dead, dead. Um, however, if you look behind me over here, we got some dino kale cold hardy as you can see nice upright green we also have some swiss chard back here to my left uh which is less cold hardy than dino kale but cold hardy in general um and then closer to me kind of lower on the screen right in this area are some lettuces, some arugula, some kale, um, some of which is flowering because it's been there since August. But all of these things that are, I'm kind of sitting in front of are cold hardy. So when you winterize your garden, what you're essentially doing is pulling out the plants that are not cold hardy. Um, and, you know, just kind of practicing what some people call garden sanitation, uh, which is getting out the dead plants and just kind of cleaning up. Um, so why is like winterizing a thing as far as getting the dead plants out? Well, so a lot of people, uh, a lot of people talk about dis plant diseases that are present in the dead tissue of, let's say my tomatoes right here. So if you get that plant physically out of your garden and you burn it or you throw it away or you put it in a really hot compost pile to break down. Uh, that disease is theoretically taken away from your garden and your soil is protected a little bit for future, um, you know, disease-free growing seasons. Um, I would also argue that winterizing by pulling out your dead plants is also just a, an, a partially due to, you know, aesthetics. Uh, a lot of people don't like the look of these, you know, dead 
I mean, it's not, it's not beautiful. Uh, dead plants. Um, however, I'm here to maybe rock that boat a little bit because I have always kind of looked at gardening as a way to try to mimic natural ecosystems. And, you know, uh, a, a certain amount of square footage that's devoted to an intensive annual production of plants that I'm constantly pulling out to eat is not natural. Like it is not a natural ecosystem to start with an annual vegetable garden. But I do try to pull from, you know, what you can witness in natural ecosystems like forests, savannas, prairies, you know, riparian ecosystems and try to mimic what, what you can in a garden setting so that uh, you have more diversity of insects. And why do we want a diversity of insects? Well, we want a diversity of insects uh, because insects are, other than plants, uh, kind of like amongst the building blocks for our food web. So plants are the base of our food web. Plants are the only thing that makes their own food by taking energy from the sun and turning it into sugars that they use for energy. And then a lot of insects are herbivores that eat those plants and they have specific relationships with specific plants that they eat. And then, you know, there's a whole myriad of other organisms that eat the insects. And for birds like songbirds, for example, while some songbirds might just eat like seeds, they feed their babies insects because insects have a really pound for pound have more protein generally than other livestock like cows and pigs. So they are very nutrient dense. So they form the base diet of a lot of the rest of the food web. So plants, first level importance, insects fall right behind. So um, as a gardener, it's really important to me amongst other things that are important to me. It's really important to me to um, protect all insects. Um, you know, some insects are pests for sure and I don't like them. But um, there's a lot of really good insects that I do like and I want to keep around. So what do I do to protect those insects over our really harsh, well, I would imagine for an insect, harsh temperatures? So a couple things. One, as you've surely heard me talk about, if you've watched any of these, is I mulch the garden with leaves. Now you can also mulch with straw. That's probably more common. Um, but mulching provides little nooks and crannies that are somewhat covered or, you know, out of like the weather, out of the wind, out of the rain um, for insects to overwinter. And some insects overwinter in their adult form. Some o insects overwinter in their larval form. Some insects overwinter just as eggs. So it depends on what insect we're talking about, how they're going to overwinter and what life stage and where they're going to do it. But a lot of them do it in plant matter. Uh, leaves are plant matter. These dead tomatoes are plant matter. My uh, asparagus right here is plant matter. So providing that habitat to hide and keep a little bit warmer over the winter months is really important for those insects. Um, so one, mulching. Mulching is a lot more than just protect insects over the winter time. It's got this whole host of benefits to your garden. I can't like praise the act of mulching enough in gardening, but in this context, in this through this lens that we're talking about, as far as winterizing your garden for the benefit of insects, mulching provides winter habitat, so it's important. For example, do you like ladybugs? Ladybugs overwinter as adults in leaf litter. So, if you don't know, as a as a gardener, I love ladybugs, uh, not only because they're adorable, but because their larvae are prodigious. Uh, like carnivores that eat a lot of aphids and aphids are one of the one of like the real bad pests you know they have a really fast lifespan I don't know I don't we're not talking about aphids today but uh, but ladybugs are a good pest uh, predator in the garden so I want to provide ladybugs a space to overwinter my garden so that I have ladybugs next year so maybe I have less aphids and I don't have to spray my soapy water on the plants anymore. Um, what else should you do? Well, okay, so this next trick is, I try to walk the line with it. Um, it. I do find it challenging, but I'll still talk about it. And I'll talk about why I find it challenging. 
but I'm going to move you down here. So this is uh, a mix of sorrel and a mix of henbit, a mix of dead nettle. So these are all cool season weeds. So they germinated in, you know, August and September will live over the winter and then they will flower next spring and early summer. So you want to keep a you want to keep weeds in your garden for a few reasons. One, soil and the living soil, like the things that live in soil, like the bacteria, the fungi, the nematodes, the protozoa, those things need living roots to do their thing. Oftentimes they don't live without plants. So you need living roots in your garden over the winter time to protect those invertebrate communities that are so important to the gardening season. Um, so oftentimes for me, that's a mix of letting cool season weeds go um, on the edges of beds and walkways in populations that I know that I can tackle next spring when I go out and plant everything again. Um, and that also, um, kind of lost my train of thought, but, but those, those soil invertebrates need living roots, uh, to live throughout the winter. So those aren't like the insects you normally think of like cucumber beetles, ladybugs, butterflies, but these things are like, like I said, the bacterias, the fungi, the protozoa, the nematodes, worms, insects, those are all things that are incredibly important to organic gardeners. Um, and we need to think about them too when we winterize our garden. So you don't want to like pull every single weed because that, um, we need like those living roots in the soil. Uh, kind of, okay, so we're going to keep with the weeds for a second then we're going to go back to living roots because I think that'll make more sense. Um, weeds, keeping these cool season weeds living over the winter not only provides living roots for those soil invertebrates to like hang out with and like live with um, because they cannot live without them. Uh, it also provides a really good uh, nectar flow in the early season uh, in 2021. So dandelions, man, people hate dandelions in their yard. And I don't get it. Like what's, I don't know, what's wrong with dandelions? In a gardener's sense, dandelions are great because it's an early food source or nectar source for bees, honeybees, bumblebees as they get their colonies back going, mason bees, carpenter bees. Like there's not a lot of flowers when, de de uh, when dandelions are blooming. So it's a major carbohydrate source for these really important pollinators. This mix of uh, dead nettle, hen bit, sorrel that I pointed to down here by my dead tomatoes, that little, you know, I got patched like that all over the place. Oh my gosh. Weeds are not a problem for me. Um, though those will all flower purple for the dead nettle and henbit, um, yellow for the sorrel. Uh, those will all flower in the spring too, and also provide food sources for those pollinators. Um, and not, you know, bees aren't the only pollinators. There's a lot of beetles that are pollinators. Flies are important pollinators. So not all like the sexy insects are pollinators. Uh, but most insects are pollinators because nectar is sugar and everything loves sugar. Um, and almost everything we eat relies on pollinators and pollination through insects. Um, even if it's not like a direct, like we eat fruit. Okay. Here's a good example. Like carrots are roots, but we need pollinators to make, to fertilize and pollinate the flower so that we get carrot seeds so that we can plant carrots to eat carrots. So like, there can be like levels to it, you know? Um, so to circle the background, when you're overwintering your garden, leave some weeds. The reason why you do that is to have preserved living roots in the soil for the soil microbe, microbes in the food web that they uh, work in um, because they need living roots to live themselves and also to provide early season flowers for pollinators of all stripes next spring. Kind of in that same boat, uh, if you can plant perennials and that's not just like perennial vegetables, that's also like, uh, perennial wildflowers, uh, perennial shrubs, trees, 
as much plant diversity as you can pack in your garden, the better and more habitat and food sources there will be for the insects in your garden. So through the lens of like a winterizing element, um, this, let's see, let me turn you. This is my, well, it's not mine, it's my neighbor's asparagus patch. And this uh, asparagus is a medium lived perennial, if that makes sense. It lives for about 10, 15 years, sometimes 20. Um, and um, there's a lot of insect overwintering habitat in those like nooks and crannies. Uh, there's a lot of like warmth to be had in this mass of perennials. There's also living roots year round for those bacteria, the fungi, the microbes that live in that soil. So if you can incorporate perennials, um, again, we're trying to mimic as best we can natural ecosystems. And there aren't many ecosystems, if there's any, that are straight annual ecosystems, meaning like there's only plants growing in them for three to six months and then the rest of the time it's just bare soil just waiting for plants to grow. We need more plant life because the more plant life there is, the more insects, the more birds, the more everything. It's just kind of the, the food web builds from there. And the more diverse food web that our garden can support, the stronger like the general ecosystem is. Um, okay, so another thing. So to recap, mulch always for everything um leave some weeds plant perennials another fourth is wait as long as you can to pull this stuff out so like i talked about earlier um people love to pull this stuff out as soon as you can because of like plant disease and stuff but i also think due to aesthetics but uh again there's a lot of overwintering insect habitat in here so what i've done for several years and i you know, realize that I'm lucky to be able to do this because I have a really big yard, is when I choose to pull the tomato plants and, you know, other, um, other like tender plants for winterizing, I can just stack them somewhere else in my yard so that hopefully I can still preserve some of those insect populations that are kind of like hibernating, um, in this mass of plants. Um, and I'm not getting them off my property, but I'm also hoping to, if there's any plant disease in the tissues of this plant, trying to get them out of my garden. Um, other, other plant or other garden winterizing things that you can do to provide overwinter habitat for insects is to leave boards down, uh, have straw bales out, buckets, anything that bugs can like kind of crawl under and hide under that will be something that they um, do over the winter time so that's kind of all I have on winterizing your garden through the lens of preserving your insect populations so it's a little bit messier than kind of the traditional English kitchen garden um, it keeps dead plants in your garden longer it covers the soil with organic plant matter when I say organic, I mean things that break down like like leaves or straw or maybe mulch in your permanent pathways. Um, leave some weeds. Uh, plant perennials and native perennials if you can, if you have space. If you don't have space in your garden, maybe plant them around your garden um, so that the soil microbes can cling to those in the winter months when they're looking for some living roots. Um, if you have any questions about winterizing your garden, um, please let me know. Uh, contact us through Facebook or email and we'll love to answer your question, keep the conversation rolling. Um, and so I guess now maybe we can do just a short pivot to kind of <coughs> some just timely, timely things in the garden. So I guess... For me, it is to go again to look at the overwintered greens because I want to cover them and maybe I can show you how I do it. It's really easy. You probably don't need to see it, but if you wanted to, you can watch. Okay, so we're gonna move to another section of the garden. And I'm gonna turn you around. 
Okay, garden. So as you can see, I mean, before I move, like we have a lot of asparagus, a lot of weeds. Um, we have perennial shrubs in the garden. We have a lot of like dead plant matter that's like vining up on cattle panels. Uh, lots of weeds, lots of different size, you know, like life stages of weeds. Um, lots of things on the ground for things to hide under. Some living greens still. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit of chaos, but. Okay, so here is the overwintered green section. And you know, this rain this week has been challenging um, in a work sense to like get out and like work in the rain, but my greens have been loving it. This spinach is lovely. It's ready for its second harvest already, which is, I had no, I did not think that that was going to happen. Um, so I'm going to turn you back around. Hi. Um, so in Columbia, it's supposed to get pretty cold again tonight. Um, I, we have another frost warning. Um, so if your tender plants haven't already died, they might die tonight. And there's also looks like some like wintry mix in the forecast for early next week. So I think we're like solidly in fall and winter right now. Um, so because of that, I'm going to cover my greens, even though these are cool, hardy plants and they love the cold. Spinach is one of the cold hardiest plants that we can grow here in mid Missouri. Um, I just kind of want to baby them, I guess right now. Um, so I'm going to cover them and there'll come a point, you know, in the winter that this would be like a balmy day and maybe I would uncover them to get some fresh air and wind circulation and stuff like that. But, um, right now, I mean, yesterday was 85 and that's like not even an exaggeration. So they're just, they're not like there yet. Um, so I have this plastic, this greenhouse plastic that's weighted down in between the greens. And so I'm going to um, cover them. And what I'm going to try to do is just do it. I'm going to unplug my microphone and then I'm just going to cover them so you can kind of see what they look like when they're covered. Hopefully this works.
okay. So that's kind of the process. I keep the two pieces of, pl actually it's one piece of plastic. I keep it weighted down in the middle. So I just fold the sides in uh, when I take the covers off. And then when I know it's gonna get cold again, I put them back over their hoops and I weight them down. And weighting them down is like really important because this is plastic, it can just, um, you know, get caught by the wind and fly away really fast. Um, that's also why it's important to not make your hoops too high. Uh, these are about three feet tall, uh, so they don't catch like a ton of wind. They're kind of growing behind like a, a shed and some like vines, so it's hopefully not so windy as in just like an open field, but um, so far I have not had an issue. So that's the only thing I'm going to do tonight in preparation for the next round of cold weather because pretty much everything I had in my garden died last week. So if you do not have things that died last week because maybe your microclimate is a little bit warmer than mine, um, be sure to harvest all your tomatoes, your peppers, uh, eggplant, squash, any of those tender things because they probably aren't going to make it much longer. Um, you don't have to make it through tonight, Monday, it looks kind of cold. It's that time of year. Um, you can cover things with sheets, uh, but greens kind of as a rule of thumb and roots are pretty cold hardy. So all of that stuff should be okay um, in general, unless you're like me and you want to baby your stuff. Um, but yeah, that's it. Um, winter time and it's coming, especially you can feel it today. You didn't, it didn't really seem like that yesterday. But, um, but yeah, it's a time of transition in the garden. And I do encourage all gardeners to kind of look at it through the lens of how can you pre preserve your garden's ecosystem? Um, because as gardeners, that's really important. Uh, we depend on the insects um, to help grow our plants. So if you have any questions, please let us know via social media. Um, until then, I'll see you guys on Monday. Bye.